Dakar 2, The World's Ultimate Rally Dakar is a series of racing games that focuses on some of the most dangerous of racing events. We get into the game and... yeah, these bikes do not handle very well. I often flew right off the thing in situations where you really wouldn't expect to. I tried out the cars, since this isn't primarily a biking game after all, and this was far better. No, not even that, I actually had fun with this game. The locations may not be the most interesting, but the actual level design I consider very well done. Performing sleek turns, with the occasional bump in the road, makes for some exciting gameplay. Dance Dance Revolution Mario Mix Oh my god! So the story goes, the Mushroom Kingdom keeps four music keys in their safekeeping which keeps chaos and discord from raining down. While Luigi has stolen and scattered them, now it's your job to dance through the kingdom to locate and return those music keys. All the while, you'll engage in short story missions and the occasional minigame. The idea for this game is solid. A DDR clone with Mario antics? How could it possibly go wrong? Well, they could make the game far too easy. I looked up footage of the end of the game and even those scenes look too easy. I had this many years ago, but I got rid of it for that reason. I can't have too much fun if I'm not being challenged. Dark Summit. There's a top secret government facility that unfortunately local snowboarders have found as a great place for boarding. You'll be completing various objectives to earn your ranks as an epic snowboarder, all the while hazardous environments and angry bypassers try to halt your progress. It's an edgy, over-the-top experience with lots of action and considerably good level design. Additionally, the graphics are impressive. Despite my own suckiness at games like this, I found Dark Summit to be a lot of fun. Seems like an underrated gem. Darkened Sky. The game started off with this cutscene that I found very bizarre and hard to follow. A girl with some mystical items questions her existence when all of a sudden she finds a Skittle. I'm not joking, this is a Skittles license game apparently. Some lord creature known as Necroth is a, a bad guy. He's not happy this girl found the first Skittle. What follows is some very janky hack and slash gameplay with questing elements. It's both open world and linear because the paths you navigate are exceptionally narrow. Making progress was fun and I was excited to see where the story was going, even if it's all a bit strange. I can admire that though, and I feel this is worthy of continuation. Dave Mira Freestyle BMX 2. You're aware of Tony Hawk games, I'm sure. Well, it's a lot like that. Pull off some sick tricks in various biking parks, show off your skills and complete objectives for points to unlock more stuff. There are a lot of moves to learn, which would take time to familiarize yourself with. Once you know how to play properly, it'll be an absolute thrill. If this genre is something that appeals to you, then definitely consider giving this one a try. Dead to Rights. You play as a cop whose father was recently shot up by some gang. The gameplay is primarily focused on third-person shooting with a story-driven campaign. The more time you invest, the more the story is uncovered. As you get there, the player will experience a blend of different gameplay types. There is the shooting, but the player will also often need to explore the area. Like, sometimes you'll need to use your dog in an almost puzzle-type situation to activate the path to the next area. The gameplay itself was moderately fast-paced and there are a lot of special moves to make its combat satisfying. Def Jam Vendetta. This is a wrestler featuring many artists from the Def Jam Records company. From what I know, they're associated with the street life of music, which suits the tone of the game. At least, in spurts. I can't help but feel this is a bit of a cartoony experience. The characters do present themselves like tough guys all the same. In terms of gameplay, yeah, I'd say this is pretty good for a wrestling game. Moves are fun to pull off, there's a whole bunch of animations. Even animations that can be interrupted by your opponent and they transition seamlessly. If you're into wrestlers, don't miss out on this one. Def Jam Fight for New York This one is far more story-oriented. D-Mob has been arrested and he's taken off to jail, but you, the player, will crash into that police car and help him escape. Now, you're a part of the team. The emulation for this game was a bit rough, but from what I did play, it demonstrated a less cartoony and more violent approach. They added some interactivity elements too. People in the crowd can actually get involved with the fight by holding you up for the opponent. Occasionally, you can pull a weapon from one of them and use it. By all appearances, they stepped their game up for this sequel. Defender. I've always been told that this arcade reboot is boring, and I can see how it would overstay its welcome after a while. It's a 3D interpretation of the arcade game, however they've given it a more modern flair. You're not just rescuing colonists, but buildings and dropships too. Colonists are handled the same, you just hover over them to pick them up. 
In this reboot, you actually have to bring them back to a safe zone after collecting three in order to save more. Would I actually return to the Defender reboot after playing up to this point? Negotiable. I feel like I've had as much fun as I needed to with this, just after two or three levels. Die Hard Vendetta. In a rogue cop situation, you jump into an ongoing crime scene where a gang has maliciously retrieved stolen art for clout. Something like that anyways. Gunshots are mysteriously fired behind the scenes, and now it's time for you to figure out what the heck's going on there. The gameplay is undeniably chunky. Did I really just say chunky? Chunky! The gameplay is undeniably clunky, relying on an outdated crosshair system. Okay, John, if you could put all your weapons into this bin by pressing action on it. Turns out this is actually a remake of a cancelled game called Die Hard 64, so it makes sense. For the two missions I played, I was thrown just outside of the combat situation to then walk in and sort it out. In this case, shoot all hostiles without hurting civilians. Very arcade-esque. I couldn't play this game for long because the FOV was nauseating. Just minutes into it, I had to take my fan out of its winter retirement to stop the hot flashes. I haven't heard good things about this game, and I have no reason to keep going. Digimon Rumble Arena 2. Initially, I was worried that this would be difficult to cover since I know nothing about Digimon, but no, this is just unashamedly Super Smash Bros. Even down to the special moves, I could replicate a large variety of the melee moveset by just using a different combination of buttons. I'm not really sure what to say, but if you're unfamiliar with Smash Bros., then well, it's a battle royale where you're pitted up against other fighters in a small, eventful arena. This isn't a bad ripoff. Sure, you'd never want to play Digimon Rumble Arena 2 over Smash Bros. Melee, but if it's all you got, then well, you could be doing a whole lot worse. Digimon World 4. I didn't play this for long, and let me tell you why. This is a hack and slash where you hack, you slash, and grind for inventory. Look, it's already not my type of game, but there are other things that imply this is not a great for its genre. Firstly is the game's method of teaching the player, which is through dialogue boxes that take no shorter than a paragraph to explain basic attacks. I kept zoning out while reading this. Secondly, the actual combat has known vulnerability frames. You'll take a beating, often without the chance to engage. The enemies are sponges who take next to no damage, yet I'll be taking plenty. This doesn't seem like a great way to start your game. I had to retry four times and even then I don't think I got very far. Hardcore Digimon fans might get something out of this, but I'd say anyone else should steer clear. Dinotopia, the Sunstone Odyssey. In this RPG, a young man must defend a land known as Dinotopia. Here, man and dinosaur live as one. However, it is not without discrimination. As you progress, you will interact with people from all walks of life, often asking you to go on quests for them in exchange for rewards. There are also main objectives where you'll pummel the crap out of ne'er-do-wells. This can be man or dino. Some of these dinos speak as you would expect them to, but then there are others that are basically humans with the exception of their outward appearance. Hello there, laddie. For as weird a story this is, it has an alluring mystical vibe to it that is enticing. I'd be interested to see where this goes, even though there are no doubt better RPGs to be playing out there. Disney Sports Basketball. This is the first in a long list of Disney games, so buckle up because we're in it for the long haul. Not off to a good start though. This may be the worst basketball game I've played. The presentation is there, but the gameplay is just atrocious. First thing I did was jump headfirst into a game and the competition was annihilating me. I barely had the chance to even press a button by the time the computer opponent scored on me. This was the easiest of three difficulties. I then ran through the tutorials, which were weird. It basically forces you to do the same one move for a minute straight. It takes way too long to learn anything. Then I went back to the main game knowing the controls and they still destroyed me before I could interact. It's very rough. Even if you could eventually learn how to play, I'm sure it's possible. There's no reason to play this over countless others. Disney Sports Football. I guess this was a series, huh? This game has even worse reviews than the last, which was concerning. Especially since I don't know how to play football. They weren't throwing me a bone either, because despite the presentation being identical to the last game, they took out the tutorial mode. So you absolutely must know how to play. This isn't kiddie football either, you gotta know all the plays. Well, otherwise it's basically Disney Sports Basketball, but it's football now. I feel like this and the other Disney Sports GameCube games would have made for a decent bundle, but separately, I, it just seems very silly to me. Still, I can't justifiably give this a yes or no since I don't know how to play. Disney Sports Skateboarding. This one has even worse reviews than their football games somehow. 
It didn't emulate too well, had a lot of large environments, but I get the idea. It's the exact same approach as the others. Has the training mode this time, like in the earlier basketball game. This isn't so much a tutorial though, more so like the game throws you into a small area with a list to complete. The main game has you do a number of skateboarding objectives within time limit, and, well, this isn't awful. It's okay. I still wouldn't bother with it though, especially since there's a much greater Disney-licensed skateboarding game that we'll get to shortly. Disney Sports Soccer. Reviews for this one are better than the last three, so I was hoping it would be the redeeming title. It felt a lot more forgiving than the others, though all these games do require some study to fully grasp. Strangely, this one, much like football, had no tutorial stage. Nonetheless, jumping straight in, I kinda got the grip. It's a fairly generic game of soccer, but it works. Two things I did notice. It was hard to determine where I was passing the ball to. It seemed to just go in the exact direction I was kicking, regardless of who was nearby. The other thing is how the screen seems a bit crunched. If this had widescreen, it'd be a lot better. Yeah, this game isn't bad. Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure. This one didn't work properly on the emulator. All the map textures were green for some reason. So here we are now on authentic hardware. You may think this is just a Tony Hawk knockoff, and yeah, it kind of is, but it was co-developed by the same people who worked on those games. It even uses the engine from Pro Skater 4. It's very similar to those games, so inevitably shares its greatness. Now, I would show you what the game is all about, but for some reason every time I pressed a button other than A, the game would crash. Fate doesn't want me to play this today. But disregard my technical issues, because I've had this game for years on the PlayStation 2, and it's a lot of fun. You're given a selection of characters to choose from, each with their own unique stages. There are objectives to complete, but you can also just goof around with countless special moves as if it's a sandbox mode. There's a lot of attention to detail and great gameplay to make this a solid package altogether. If you like skateboarding games, or just the familiar Disney atmosphere, this game lives up to its branding and has aged very well. Your tricks all look impressive to me. Disney's Hide and Sneak. I'm not even sure how to explain this one. Some UFO shaped like a mushroom crash lands on Earth, which interests Minnie, who is accidentally captured. Mickey rushes to the rescue, but instead of tackling the threat head-on, he uses a stealthy approach, which creates the basis for the gameplay. Basically, it's a stealth platformer, structured around maze level design. One by one, Mickey will encounter strange UFO creatures, which the player will have to sneak past by using the environment to their advantage. From what I played, this usually meant collect a key, then get to the next room. The process then repeats. What comes to mind when I play this is that it's like Metal Gear Solid, but extremely watered down and for kids. Unfortunately, I felt the gameplay was very slow and uninteresting. Nothing about this struck me as worth seeing through. Disney's Magical Mirror starring Mickey Mouse. This is one of the strangest games ever. So Mickey's mirror summons a demon. This causes a part of Mickey's consciousness to awaken and he jumps into the mirror. It's purposefully vague storytelling, I think. The animations are so stiff that Mickey often resembles an animatronic. It makes some of his movements highly unsettling. I actually love this, but I know it's not intentional. So what's the gameplay like, you may be asking? Well, it's a point and click adventure. Know what else it is? Really slow just short of unbearably so. This game is supposedly three hours long, and I'm sure if it weren't for the drawn out, unskippable, and often useless cutscenes, it'd only be like an hour. The game is filled with bizarre, abstract ideas that I really like. I think the formula for a great game is here, but the execution is pretty awful. I don't think I'd continue playing for that reason alone, but I do think there's quality here, so I'm leaving it undecided. Disney's Party. It's Mario Party, but with Disney characters. First things first, for those of you who don't know what Mario Party is, it's a video game that takes on the form of a board game, with mini-games sprinkled in between, as well as wacky hijinks that can take place on the board. So how is this Disney interpretation? Well, I'd rather play Mario Party any day if that tells you something. You know that later Wii Mario Party game that used cars, where everyone was always in the same space? Yeah, it's like a precursor to that. Instead of actually playing the game board, there's a roulette system that determines where everyone's going to go. Sometimes it's a minigame, sometimes it's the item shop. At the end of a round, you get this needlessly complicated board map thing that you all compete within. This made no sense. They tried to explain it with like a hundred different text boxes, but just made it way too confusing. I don't know if I would say this is like bad, but it's definitely not good. Disney's PK Out of the Shadows. Donald Duck is having problems with his girlfriend Daisy which for some reason makes him wish he was a superhero, because that'll show him. Kind of a weird train of thought, but whatever. It gets you into the game quick, and I appreciate that. 
This game got mediocre reviews, which I found puzzling, until I found out that PK is based on The Duck Avenger, a beloved comic series that is supposedly not translated well into this 3D platformer. I think if you put that past you though, this game is a lot of fun. I actually had a blast playing this. In this game, you'll play as Donald's newly discovered Persona superhero, PK. PK will blast his way through semi-linear stages to make it from point A to B. It's fast-paced, super easy to get into, and has a lot of personality. I think you should give it a look. I know I'll be keeping an eye out for this one next time I go game shopping. Disney's Tarzan Untamed. You know those movie licensed games you played growing up? The kind that didn't really seem to know what it was doing and had a hundred different gameplay modes to make up a story? Well, this is basically that. I've often thought that this approach, while lazy, doesn't necessarily make for a bad game. Is Tarzan Untamed bad? No, it's okay. I feel pretty much the same about this game as I do many other games like it. The primary focus is swinging across the jungle while saving trapped primates caged by hunters. Otherwise, you could be sliding down a rushing river or sliding across an idle river. Chances are you already know what kind of game this is, and if these appeal to you, then I can't say Tarzan Untamed is a worse choice than the rest. Donald Duck, going quackers. Daisy is doing a televised broadcast at her new job. She's put into a dangerous situation where she gets kidnapped by a magician live on TV. Donald witnesses this, who begins his quest to find and rescue her. The experience consists of platforming inspired by games like Crash Bandicoot. Enter a stage, reach the end, don't die. You won't be breaking crates, but you will be collecting lots of presents. There are of course enemies to avoid. If you get hit, Donald goes quackers. This means he enters a rage mode for a few moments where he will take no damage. Get hit a second time and it's back to a checkpoint. I enjoyed what I played of going quackers, and I could see myself playing through this whole thing on a lazy afternoon. Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. This is the first of three games that were made for the DK Bongos controller. Jungle Beat plays a lot like the Game Boy Advance game King of Swing. You control Donkey Kong by hitting left or right on the bongos. You can interact with the environment by clapping. The gameplay is extremely fast paced, to the point where it can feel like an auto runner sometimes. Of course, you still have full control of Donkey Kong, the levels are just very linear, with a few short paths that always end up leading back to the main one. At the end of a world, you encounter a boss fight which is almost like Punch-Out in a way. Press the right buttons, dodge their attack, and pull off a crazy combo at the right time. If you're into fast paced platforming, then Jungle Beat is the game for you. Donkey Konga. As designed for the DK Bongos, you'll be hitting the notes on time to some classic tracks, including but not limited to the Donkey Kong rap from Smash Bros. Melee and the Kirby Right Back At You theme. There are various difficulty levels and multiple challenges to overcome. Interacting with the bongos is easy, and right off the bat you're able to play some challenging stages. Not all of them, as the highest difficulties are locked. I feel like this game accomplishes what the DDR Mario game couldn't. Donkey Konga is tons of fun if you're into rhythm games. Donkey Konga 2. So how can the sequel compare to the original Donkey Konga? Well, it definitely has a better UI. It's more stylized, there's a better emphasis on color and organization. Regarding what the game accomplishes, it may be the better game, but that might depend on who you ask. In particular, the music selection is going to play a big part of this. Whereas the original seemed more in tune with a family environment, this one has a selection that feels more edgy mid-2000s teenager. I believe the game is overall more difficult than the previous game, but probably because these songs are a lot more complicated. I'm not presenting these facts as a negative, I'm just presenting them as information. Donkey Konga 2 is functionally better than the first game, but the rest is up to subjectivity. Dora the Explorer, Journey to the Purple Planet. Five small aliens decided to land on Earth for no reason in particular, specifically Flinky, Inky, Plinky, Dinky, and Owl. There's no reason for this game to have a Pac-Man reference as its focus, but forget that part. Shortly after, the ship falls apart for, again, no reason in particular, and now the aliens must find a new spaceship so they can go back home to the Purple Planet. And so I must ask, why did you land here in the first place? So this is honestly a pretty good interpretation of the show, which I have seen once or twice. Think of a typical adventure with Dora. The characters will follow their map, encountering some hazards and roadblocks along the way that they'll just have to avoid. In translation to the game, Dora will casually walk in a mostly linear path, collecting space gems as she goes, which acts as fuel for the alien ship, or something like that. There's a roadblock? Go find something to use in order to cross. This is probably the most accurate show to video game transition I've ever seen. Other than the fact that it's in 3D, so I guess maybe that trophy belongs to South Park. The only problem is Dora walks real slow, so it takes a while to get from one place to another. No doubt to extend the length of the game. 
If you're still curious about Dora's journey to the Purple Planet, consult this review by Kiara Hyde. I have been playing this forever, and I love it more than anything. I would just like to say that I'm 27 and married, but I just got fired from my job and have been playing this since. I really liked when Boots did that one sexy thing. I think I might be in love. Thank you. I'm sure this game would be fun for small children. As expected, this isn't an experience suitable for anyone outside of the intended demographic. Doshin the Giant. Best way I can explain this game is that it's a giant simulator in a sandbox style. You play as Doshin, who serves to protect or destroy this local island. The goal of the game is to have an amount of monuments erected in your honor or your hatred. In order to get these built, you'll need to accomplish the needs of your fellow islanders. Or do the opposite. Destroy their villages, trample people, it's all up to you. I'm not sure why they'd create monuments for your acts of terrorism, but maybe it's their way of pleading? You can swap to a devilish version of yourself on command, who can more easily cause chaos. I've heard with enough investment this can be a rewarding or punishing game, which sounds about right given the player's constant choice between being good or evil. Dr. Muto. A mad scientist teamed up with the president to solve a power crisis. He uses a newly invented device to do this that accidentally ends up destroying the planet, so now it's up to him to rebuild it and resolve this mistake. As expected from a platformer surrounding a mad scientist, the gameplay is very unique and creative. You will use various gadgets to take down enemies, open doors, and transform into one of five creatures to better explore the environment. The game's personality is ridiculous and charming, with a chaotic neutral narrator robot and the wacky shenanigans of the Doctor. Solving the few short puzzles and platforming in the mostly linear world was lots of fun. Check this one out. Dragon Ball Z Budokai. My apologies, but much like Digimon, I know very little about Dragon Ball. I'll do the best that I can. This game seems to follow the beginning events of Dragon Ball Z, starting from square one with the introduction of the Saiyans. Goku must now defeat the invaders to protect his family, friends, and the Dragon Balls. The game plays out based on its story. You'll most often be fighting in one-to-one -one matches against your opposition. Of course, you can't forget that there's an engaging multiplayer focused on these fights, which have been something the fans are known to enjoy in local tournaments. Occasionally, the game will make you engage in what could be considered a minigame, which is a little gimmicky, but serves to advance the plot, I suppose. The storyline is, as many Dragon Ball Z fans will tell you, violent, action-packed, and charming in its own unique way. I enjoyed what I played, and I have no doubt that this would be a great choice for fans of the series. Dragon Ball Z Budokai 2 I was expecting this to basically be a part 2, but this game tries to do things a little differently. As far as I was concerned, this is the same story as well, but apparently while the original Budokai follows up to the Cell Game Saga, Budokai 2 covers up to the Kid Buu Saga. I don't know what any of that means, so you be the judge. The combat remains the same, although everything leading up to it is different. This isn't linear storytelling anymore, instead you're given a sort of board game setup. Basically, the player is given a greater choice in the order that they want to advance the story. There are some exceptions to that rule. An enemy has as much freedom on the board as you do, so they can just come and fight you if they want. This is probably a better setup than the first game. I did like the linear storytelling of the original, but this works just as well, if not better. Dragon Ball Z Sagas. I wasn't sure what to expect with this one going in. Turns out it's a pseudo-platformer beat-em-up. There are implications that a lot has happened since the beginning of the Dragon Ball Z story, so this probably isn't a game to jump straight into. What you'll do in this game is locate items as necessary for mission objectives, or fight an assortment of enemies to progress to the next... screen. Not a literal use of that word. The game has invisible walls that prevent you from progressing if you haven't accomplished the task at hand. At the end of a stage, you may encounter a boss, which at first seemed challenging, until the guy got stuck in a stun lock where I just kept hitting buttons to win. I wasn't feeling this one. The charm of Dragon Ball Z is there, but the gameplay was mediocre. Dragon's Lair 3D, Return to the Lair. You're probably at least aware of the popular Laserdisc arcade game Dragon's Lair by Don Bluth. Now imagine translating that to a 3D platformer. The game focuses on the same room-by-room -room aspect of the original. Instead of pressing a button at the right time, you must now solve mini puzzles in order to escape to the next area. These puzzles are often filled with environmental interactions and hilarious set pieces, which bring this game to life. I think it all looks and plays great, with the one exception of the controls, you must stow away your sword in order to interact with things. I got stuck a few times wondering what to do because I kept forgetting about that. I also kept forgetting that the jump button is bound to Y, whereas I'm so used to pressing A. But other than that, Dragon's Lair 3D is a highly entertaining and engaging experience. 
Driven. This is a movie license game? I know, you'd expect this to just be some traditional Formula One racer. The first thing to tip you off is the voice of Sylvester Stallone. I actually had this game when I was younger, and I think I see now why I stopped playing it. The very second stage tells you that you have to complete a lap in the zone to continue. At no point does the game tell you what the zone is. See that rising bar on the bottom left of the screen? Filling it up to the very top puts you into the zone. It increases as you stay on track. As the meter rises, your vision gets blurry, but this is a good thing, as the game implies. If you so much as get close to the edge of the track or god forbid hit something, that meter drops way down. Keeping this up for an entire lap is rather difficult, but totally unreasonable is the very second thing required to continue the game. Unfortunately, I am not driven to give Driven a passing score. Drome Racers. This game has a gimmick. Your cars are made out of giant Lego pieces. Yep, this is an officially licensed Lego game. Unfortunately, this concept is purely visual as far as I could tell. You're not going to be building the cars if that's what you were expecting. There is an upgrading system in the game's garage mode, but even there its customization is very basic. While that aspect of the game is underwhelming, the actual racing isn't too bad. The first race puts me into a car that did not handle well, which felt like a bad sign. Then the second race put me into something far easier to manage, and this was okay. While you race, you'll notice that the game has wipeout mechanics like boost pads and power-ups to use against your opponents. It doesn't feel as gratifying as wipeout, but the idea is there to have fun with. I'm not sure how I feel about drum racers. I wouldn't really play this over any other Wipeout clones I'm aware of, especially since I could just play Wipeout. But does that make the game bad? Not really. There's a reason why I have the Undecided rank. It's for games like this.